بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, I would like to start off by first thanking the Islamic University of Technology, SIKS, for arranging this webinar and inviting me to give a presentation on this important subject. And I would also like to uh, extend, extend my thanks to all the listeners, whether you're listening live or will be listening to uh, a recording of the session later. Uh, you know, uh, you know uh, I want to thank you for showing interest in this topic as it's an especially important one for those engaged in da'wah to be familiar with. Now, as I move forward along into my presentation, I will be referring to the notion of believing in God without religion as deism. That way we have a clear and simplified single term we could use to allude to this phenomenon. Now, to be forthright, deism is a specific kind of non-religious belief in God, uh, but the substantive core elements of deism, as I'll explain later, inshallah, are, are predominantly found in most, if not all, conceptions of non-religious beliefs in God. So the agenda of this presentation today, you know, we'll first start off by defining what deism is, and then we'll briefly discuss the historical development of deism, and uh, we'll briefly touch upon uh, the relevance of deism today in our times. And then we're going to be advancing three different critiques of deism. And then, inshallah, we will conclude with, with uh, some final remarks. So what, what is deism? Well, deism can be defined as the belief that God created yet remains uninvolved in the world and that man should only accept religious and moral knowledge obtainable through the strict use of reason. So deism can be defined as the belief in a God who chooses not to intervene or be involved in the affairs of his creation. And in light of that, deism asserts that God does not send divine revelation to his creation, and it denies the existence of miracles because it maintains that God does not intervene in the natural world order in any way. Uh, moreover, deism stresses the importance of human reason. Um, any religious knowledge, any moral knowledge of halal and haram that you wish to obtain can only be obtained through the strict use of reason. So in a nutshell, deism is the belief in a God who created the universe and chose to never intervene or be involved in it. That this God is disinterested, he is disinterested in the universe, and uh, it teaches that we must rely on our reason alone in order to deduce what this God demands from us if he demands anything at all. Now, what we need to bear in mind that deists are not monolithic. So despite that definition uh, that I just gave, uh, we should note that deists do disagree with each other on a host of theological issues. So for example, is there an afterlife? And if there is one, is there divine judgment in this afterlife? Uh, is there a path to salvation? What is the purpose of life? What kind of attributes does God have? Um, is God a good God or is he an evil God, etc.? So deists have historically tended to disagree with each other on these critical questions. However, despite these differences, uh, the, the definition of deism that I just offered is a fundamental belief shared by all of them and thus uh, helps guide our discussion on, on the subject. A brief history of deism. Um, there, uh, there, uh, the classical Sunni Islamic scholars uh, across the theological spectrum, um, they they refuted a religious sect that they identified as the Barahima or Brahmins in English, and and this religious sect, I mean, which were based in India, they were they were pantheists who who denied that God sends prophets, and they also argued for the sufficiency of human reason 
um, you know, for deducing our moral codes. Um, today, we can benefit from the rebuttals that our classical Islamic scholars raised against the Barahima in our debates and discussions today against modern deists, as modern deists hold core views similar to those of the Barahima whom our classical scholars refuted. However, to, we, need to, to bear, we need to bear something in mind, academically speaking. Now, now even though even though we can, uh, we can find early traces of people and religions adopting beliefs similar to deists like the Barahima, the term deism has a very specific academic meaning and reference. So in academia, it specifically refers to that movement um, whose, whose emergence we could trace back to the late 17th century during the English Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a, um, it was a major intellectual movement that strongly emphasized the importance of reason and, and the freedom of people to choose uh, their own religious or non-religious worldviews. Um, it stressed the importance of notions such as tolerance and uh, rationality and scientific inquiry and, and secularism and so on. So deism was easily uh, palatable to, to the Enlightenment thinkers as deism facilitated for them the ability to emphasize the importance of reason and, and be strongly opposed to the theological doctrines of Christianity, which, which they uh, deemed to be incoherent. Um, moreover, it was uh, during this period that, that world exploration voyages uh, exposed the Europeans to different religions and people from different religious backgrounds. Uh, and uh, over time, the idea of religious salvific pluralism also started influencing them as they began to think that it did not make sense for God to punish all of these non-Christians in hell for simply not having accepted uh, the, the Christian gospel. And, and so the enlightenment, uh, the enlightenment served as a critical backdrop for the development and spread of deism. And until today, deism is still around and adopted by people who may not even call themselves deists, let alone even know what deism even is, though it's precisely what they are in reality. Deism today. Um, so, I mean, just a few things to look at here. So uh, on the left side of the screen, you could see some findings from a Pew research study that was conducted a few, uh, a few years ago. And uh, basically this, uh, 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 you know, they, they asked ex-Muslims, what, what were the reasons why they left Islam? And you could see that in the, uh, in the top, you would see that don't like organized religion uh, received one of the highest scores. So a lot of these people who left Islam um, did not necessarily leave because they, start, they stopped believing in God or because they got attracted to another religion or rather because they got fed up with the idea of religion altogether. Um, and on the top right side of the screen, you could see an, uh, a Facebook page in Arabic, uh, uh, belonging to Arab deists, like an Arab deist group. And on the bottom right, you could see an article that discusses the rise of deism in, in Turkey. And so uh, the only reason why I'm, I'm showing this is, uh, is to just highlight and, and I'm sure uh, you know, there's uh, strong anecdotal evidence that all of us are probably familiar with uh, that reinforces the idea that um, deism is uh, emerging in different pockets of the Muslim world, and it's an idea that we need to contend with. Um, so with that said, I think we can move on to our first argument, which is uh, basically deism's incoherence uh, considering God's wisdom. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is that I'm first going to lay out the argument, and then I'm going to elaborate on it, okay? So this is the argument. So first premise, premise number one, wisdom necessitates acting in a meaningfully objectives-driven manner. Wisdom necessitates acting in a meaningfully objectives-driven manner. Premise two, God is either perfectly or exceedingly wise. Premise three, deism does not affirm God's intervention in the world. 
premise. For God's wisdom is incompatible with his non-intervention in the world. Conclusion, deism is incoherent. Now, this argument takes the form of a syllogism. So meaning we first present uh, some premises or propositions or assumptions which set out to make certain claims. Then based on these claims, we attempt to derive a conclusion. Now, in order for this syllogistic argument to work effectively, two things must be fulfilled. First, we must demonstrate the, the truthfulness or the veracity of the premises themselves. Secondly, the conclusion must logically follow from these premises. So is that the case with this argument here? Um, I would contend that it is. So let's explore uh, some of these, uh, the, the, these premises together. So the first premise states, wisdom necessitates acting in a meaningfully objectives-driven manner. Basically, all this is saying is that if one were to act wisely, then one ought to act in a meaningful manner, which would involve achieving certain objectives. And this premise is actually very straightforward and will not be seriously disputed uh, by deists. Um, Ibn al-Qayyim al a classical Islamic scholar, very well known, describes divine wisdom as encapsulating God's desired ends of his creation and commands, for whose purpose he created and legislated. And Ibn al-Wazir, another classical Islamic scholar, articulates God's wisdom as a specific kind of knowledge which God has about unknown benefits, meaning unknown to us human beings, uh, good intellects, and preferable interests. This manifests in the actions of God by transforming from potentiality to reality. So in summary, God's wisdom can be uh, defined as that aspect of his knowledge that wills the actualization of anything which furthers the objectives and goals God set out in his intended act. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not act in a meaningless manner. There is always a goal or objective underlying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions. Premise two. God is either perfectly or exceedingly wise. Now, again, the overwhelming majority of deists would also agree with this premise. In fact, I don't think that any deist um, would seriously dispute it. Uh, deists believe God is the great architect. Now, why do deists even believe in God to begin with? Well, because they believe, they recognize that the universe requires a design cries out for a designer. They believe in the argument from design, also known as the teleological argument. And the earliest deists actually used to refute the atheists for disbelieving uh, in the existence of God. God's astounding creation reflects the magnitude of his attributes. Now, for God to have meticulously designed the universe as we see it today, uh, implies that God is at least, at the very least, uh, exceedingly powerful and knowledgeable. Um, we, we know God is powerful because uh, God could not have created the universe without the tremendous ability that it demands. And we also know that God is knowledgeable because such an intricate design requires one to be knowledgeable enough to know where everything fits. All in all, the, the magnificence of the design of the universe reflects the properties of its designer. Therefore, the, the awesomeness of God's wisdom could easily be inferred uh, simply by observing the universe. And, and once again, deists would not dispute this. So you don't need to work so hard to validate this premise. Now, uh, before I go on to the next premise, I just want to say something very quickly, because uh, some of you might be thinking, why does the premise say that God is uh, either perfectly or exceedingly wise? You know, don't we Muslims believe that, that God is perfect and infinite in his attributes? And yes, we do. And obviously, we as, as Muslims uh, affirm that God is perfect in all his attributes. However, the reason why the premise says 
um, or, uh, uh, or exceedingly uh, uh, here is because uh, it requires extra effort to provide a rational argument uh, demonstrating God's attributes to be maximally perfect. And honestly, that's not necessary for the strict purpose of this argument. So, so, you know, we, we shouldn't be overburdening ourselves when presenting an argument. We don't need to exert unnecessary effort in proving things not essential for a specific uh, uh, argument. So it's enough for the specific purpose of refuting the deist here to simply assume for the sake of argument alone that God's attributes could merely be exceedingly great, and, and that would still suffice for refuting the deist. So I repeat, you know, we Muslims believe that God is perfectly wise and not merely exceedingly wise. Uh, it's, that's actually not a valid position to hold as a Muslim. However, only for the purpose of this argument can we be willing to assume it simply for the sake of argument alone, since the perfection of God's attributes isn't a requirement for the effectiveness of this specific argument. Because if the deist will say, how did you rationally deduce that God's wisdom is perfect, then you're going to get distracted and you're going to get bogged down unnecessarily. And for the specific purpose of this argument, it's not necessary to affirm the perfection of God's wisdom. You could, you could argue for that in separately in a different context. Premise three, deism does not affirm God's intervention in the world. Well, Yes, as we just discussed, the central position of deists is that God remains um, inoperative in and unconcerned with the world he created. So again, this premise won't be disputed. Premise four, God's wisdom is incompatible with his non-intervention in the world. Now, this premise is the crux of the argument. This is the premise which deists would likely dispute and is the one in which you would have to exert some effort in improving. Now, the claim the premise is making is this. God not intervening in and being unconcerned with the affairs of his creation um, is a compromise of his wisdom. Why? Well, first of all, purposeless and, and, and meaningless acts are unwise acts. So doing, doing something for no reason at all is by definition unwise. Now, we must ask ourselves, if, uh, you know, if this designer of the universe is, is uh, infinitely or extremely wise, then how can this designer who is so wise enough to create and design this amazing universe be unwise enough to create it without any purpose. You know, uh, wise people do things for a reason. Uh, if, if finite human beings, such as ourselves, don't manufacture or create things for simply no reason whatsoever, what then about this infinitely or exceedingly wise cosmic designer? Uh, you know, also Pratana says, you know, did you think that we created you uselessly and that to us, you would not be returned? Does, does man think that he will be left neglected? And, you know, so basically what the, you know, so basically, you know, was this God who was so wise enough to be able to create the magnificently designed universe just, you know, just happened to get bored afterwards and say, you know, Oops, I, you know, I didn't mean to create this universe. Let me just leave it alone there in that corner as I want nothing to do with it anymore. I mean, that, that you know, to, you know to, to, to make that leap, it's, it, you know, it, it, it seems like a very huge and baseless leap. And, and the Quran is, is nudging us. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is nudging us and probing us to really reflect upon the viability of such a stance. So. In summary, there is tension. There is tension between believing in a perfectly or exceedingly wise God, uh, which deists acknowledge, 
and yet also believing that he created this universe without any purpose in mind and without caring about what happens to it and, and merely allows it to run its own natural uh, course uh, like a clock. So just to recap uh, the, the first argument, we'll read out the premises again. Premise one, wisdom necessitates acting in a meaningfully objectives driven manner. Premise two, God is either perfectly or exceedingly wise. Premise three, deism does not affirm God's intervention in the world. Premise four, God's wisdom is incompatible with his non-intervention in the world. Conclusion, deism is incoherent. So uh, that's the first argument. Uh, deism makes no sense in light of God being an infinitely or even exceedingly wise being. Uh, you know, in light of these four premises or claims, the, the conclusion necessarily follows. Moving on to uh, the, the, the second argument, which is basically trying to argue for the incoherence of uh, deism uh, in light of God's moral character. And we're going to be touching upon two different sub arguments here, because you have deists who believe that God is good. And you all have theists who believe that God is evil. So we're going to have to develop two different arguments to cater to each one. So here we're going to start off by addressing those deists who believe that God is good. And, and I would say that the majority of modern deists today uh, tend to fit in this camp. So deism's incoherence considering God's good moral character. So just like with the first argument, um, we're going to first lay out the argument. We're going to lay out the premises and the conclusion, and then we're going to elaborate on them, uh, inshallah. Okay, so the first premise. Premise one, goodness necessitates benevolence and justice. Premise two, deism affirms God's goodness, yet negates his worldly involvement. Premise three, God's goodness is inharmonious with his worldly non-involvement. Conclusion, deism is incoherent. Now, the first premise is not really controversial. You know, deists would agree that to be good to others implies being uh, benevolent or kind to others while also treating them justly. Um, regarding the second premise, uh, deists dif differ over this, as I just said. So some, some deists claim that God is good, while others do not. So this specific argument addresses those deists who do affirm that God is good. So, and we'll deal with those that say God is, is evil separately in the next section, inshallah. So the crux of the argument here really lies in premise number three, which states that to simultaneously affirm that God is good, while he remains disinterested and uninvolved in the affairs of his creation is problematic. Now, this is the critical premise which these deists would likely disagree with. Now, now here we need to ask an important question. How can a God who created us and, and ignores our prayers and neglects us without providing us with any uh, clear moral guidance and, and willingly uh, refuses to communicate with us, to, to give us direction and hope, be a good God. Now, let's remember something here. What, what do deists say? Deists say that we should only determine what is good based on our reason alone. Correct? Well, doesn't our reason as limited as it is, tell us that those who abandon those under their care without justification are immoral, right? So, so is it a man who abandons his family without a legitimate excuse, a, a bad father and, and husband? Well, of course he is. In a similar fashion, how can the deist logically deem that his conception of God is good when our reason tells us that he's in fact bad. I mean, didn't the deistic God create us and then abandon us? 
Well, yes, that's what deists believe. Therefore, the deistic God cannot be good according to our faculty of reason, the same faculty of reason, which deists insist that we use in order to determine what is good and bad. Now, we Muslims don't agree with this deistic standard of moral reasoning. You know, we Muslims recognize that we can't determine everything that's good and bad purely based on our reason alone, let, let, let alone could we subject God to our human standards of moral reasoning. However, what we're doing here with this argument is that we are merely demanding deists to be consistent by subjecting them to their own standards of moral reasoning. So we're, we're basically saying to the deist, okay, you want to use reason alone to determine what is good and bad. Fine. But in light of that, you must consistently acknowledge that your God is not good. And uh, so just to reiterate the argument, um, uh, goodness necessitates benevolence and justice. Premise two, deism affirms God's goodness yet negates his worldly involvement. Premise three, God's goodness is inharmonious with his worldly non-involvement. Conclusion, deism is incoherent. So in, in, in light of these three premises, then, the conclusion follows that deism is incoherent because on the one hand, it's trying to affirm that God is good, yet it's insistence that we limit ourselves to our finite reason in order to determine what is good and bad pushes us to conclude that this deistic God is in fact bad. So there is irreconcilable tension here. Um, now, uh, I did mention that there are deists who believe that God is, uh, is not good, is evil. So uh, how do we argue against those deists? So when it comes to these deists, so this will be deism's incoherence considering God's evil moral character. So once again, I'll be laying out the argument and then I'll be elaborating on it. So the first premise, objective morality exists. Premise two, objective morality cannot exist if God is evil. Premise three, deism affirms that God is evil. Conclusion, deism is incoherent. Now, when it comes to the first premise, I mean, what this premise means is that moral value judgments, what does it mean for objective mor morality to exist? It, it basically means that moral value judgments have a real truth to them. So if I say that treating someone unjustly is immoral, uh, I do not simply mean that it's subjectively immoral, but rather that it's actually in reality immoral. It really is immoral. And, and, and most deists would agree with this premise. I mean, they actually believe that there is such a real thing as good and evil. Um, in fact, they, they claim to reject organized religions such as uh, Islam and Christianity precisely because they believe that all these religions are supposedly uh, objectively evil. So this premise is not uh, in dispute. Now, when it comes to the second premise, objective morality cannot exist if God is, uh, is evil, uh, this premise is, 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 is critical to the argument. So first of all, if I believe in a God who is evil, then I know that he would not care about whatever evil that I do. Um, secondly, uh, what, becomes, what becomes our objective moral standard uh, if God himself did not instill objective moral worth into things? So, uh, you know, uh, morality then would be reduced to, to whatever rules human beings uh, can talk for themselves. But, but, but who is to say which human beings' rules are, are superior to others? You know, the Nazis had their own moral beliefs. You know, why weren't they correct? Uh, uh, you know, similarly, the, the, the ancient Aztecs used to act, sacrifice children to their gods. Uh, you know, on what basis can we say that, that they did something wrong? Um, you know, it's also said that many Eskimos believe that it's okay to sleep with other people's wives. 
Well, I mean, who, who has the objective uh, authority to say that all this is wrong? Uh, the problem is that it's impossible to truly have an objective moral standard of good unless that objective standard transcends in authority over all things and, and serves as an authoritative moral reference point. However, if God is evil or, uh, or amoral, um, uh, morally neutral, uh, without morality, sorry, amoral, not immoral, amoral, uh, then he can't serve as that sufficient uh, standard. Um, premise three, deism affirms that God is evil. So as I said, this specific argument is focusing on these deists who do believe uh, that God is evil. And yeah, so, so just, to, just to recap the argument. Um, so premise one, objective morality exists. Premise two, objective morality cannot exist if God is evil. Premise three, deism affirms that God is evil conclusion, deism is incoherent. So, so the conclusion logically follows. And, and the bulk of us, the bulk of us agree with premise one, right? You know, that objective morality exists, that things could be truly right and truly wrong. And, and you know, what do we mean by objective? Right, just to elaborate further on this argument, right? So what do we mean by objective? We mean that something is, is necessarily or inherently good or evil regardless of what anyone says. So, so even if the British Empire, you know, successfully colonized and brainwashed the entire world to, to, to accept its moral authority, and it killed off everyone who, who you know, uh, 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 so that, you know, who, whoever remained alive spoke well, spoke positively about the British Empire's moral code, the reality would be is that the British Empire still did something evil in reality, even if all the people on earth who were alive said that it's something good. So that's what an objective moral value judgment would entail, that it, it, that it is inherently uh, true regardless of what any uh, human being says. Now, uh, when it comes to premise two, uh, again, uh, you know, as argued, you cannot, you cannot have objective morality while believing that God is evil, because if God is evil, then you're left with no alternative uh, transcendental moral authority by which you can appeal to as an objective moral standard uh, via which to, to, to judge all actions and, and people. And since these deists believe God is evil, uh, they cannot simultaneously claim to believe in objective morality. However, they do claim to believe in objective morality. Hence, there is tension in their worldview and their stance is clearly incoherent. Coming to the uh, third argument, uh, which basically uh, talks about uh, the likelihood of revelation. Um, so as we said, deists, um, Deists reject the idea of divine revelation. You know, they believe that there's no need for it. And, uh, and this argument has to do with the likelihood and probability of revelation itself. So if we can show very good reasons, if we can show very good reasons for thinking why God would send down revelation, that uh, this would severely weaken the, the, the deistic case. Now, uh, this argument would mostly work against deists who affirm that God is both wise and good. So, so, so if the deists, if the deist affirms that God is both wise and good, and and the bulk of them do, the bulk of them do, then these arguments have a good chance of working uh, against them. Um, so the question here is. Are there good reasons for thinking that God would send revelation to humanity? And um, I'd say absolutely. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, as I was sifting through the, the books of the classical ulama, you know, I was able to compile a good number uh, of arguments on this front. But, you know, just for the sake of time, uh, let, me, let me just mention four. Uh, so the first one is that re divine revelation clarifies the moral commands of God. Now, Many deists would say that God does command us to be good, especially the classical deists, the early ones. Um, uh, but uh, you know, however, 
uh, God expects us to know what is good through natural revelation or through the strict use of our reason. Now, keeping aside the fact that it doesn't make sense for God to command us to be good and simultaneously not care about our universe, keeping that aside, um, we could say, okay, yes, it's, it's possible, it's possible based on reason alone to perhaps agree on, uh, uh, you know, to come to agreement that on some broad or universal moral principles, like, you know, things like, you know, it's, uh, it's good to be just or um, sexual ethics are important uh, or, or freedom of conscience is, is praiseworthy and so on. However, when it comes to the moral particulars or, or when it comes to the particular and, and specific understanding and application of these broad moral universals or broad moral principles, people strongly differ with, with each other, you know? Um, and on the other hand, divine revelation helps clarify what, 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 what specific understanding of these broad moral principles, such as, you know, justice and, and freedom of conscience and ethics, uh, you know, we should be having. And, and even though we may have disagreements regarding the interpretation of some parts of revelation uh, at times, the fact is that divine revelation has still effectively drawn some clear definitive boundaries and narrowed the scope for, for healthy uh, disagreement. Um, the, the, the second reason uh, is, is that divine revelation can disclose matters that are inaccessible by our unaided reason. So divine revelation can disclose matters that are inaccessible by our unaided reason. So uh, based on our reason alone, um, we can't know for, cer for certain if, if God uh, expects us to worship him or not or, or, or uh, uh, let, let alone if there's even a specific way he wants us to worship him. Um, uh, based on our reason alone, we, we can't know for certain if there is an afterlife or, or divine judgment or, or, or a path to salvation, which we're supposed to follow. However, revelation could, could usefully aid us in, in coming to know these things. Um, third, Point is that divine revelation clarifies the nature of our relationship with God. What is the nature of our relationship with God? You know, uh, is it is it one of friendship? You know, uh, similar to how Ibrahim, uh, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, is referred to as you know Khalilullah, you know, the friend of Allah, or or is it one of alliance? Are we the allies of Allah? Are we the awliya Allah? Or uh, is it, uh, you know, one of servitude? Are we ibadullah? Or, or is it a combination of all these things? Or some of these things? Or none of these things? Or, or, or is it like how some Christians say, you know, that there's some sort of spiritual childlike relationship with God, that we are his spiritual children, that we're, that we're the sons of God? Well, revelation could really assist us in knowing this. Fourth reason is that divine revelation justifies the moral accountability of sinners. Now, if there is a divine judgment, well, then many sinners uh, and, uh, and, and, and non-believers, uh, uh, and by the way, a, a big number of deists do believe in an afterlife. They do believe that there is divine judgment. They do believe that the worst of the worst, you know, they, some of them do believe in a hell, that they believe in a divine uh, afterlife, that they, a lot of them do affirm this. So, but, but if there is a divine judgment, you know, then, then many sinners and non-believers could, could, could argue back against God on the day of judgment by saying that he never warned them because, you know, he never sent them a, a revelation clarifying what his demands were. You know, that, that, that they had no idea that he even wanted them to abide by a certain moral code or to adopt specific theological beliefs. You know, however, with revelation, th that, that excuse isn't available to, to the non-believer. You know, and as Allah SWT says in the Quran, you know, you know we, uh, 
you know, we, we would have punished the people unless we sent them a, a messenger. Uh, so that, uh, that's sort of an exemplification of Allah's uh, attribute of, of justice. And, and, and so with, with the warning by the messenger having been given through divine revelation, you know, those who did injustice could be fairly held uh, morally accountable. So, I mean, just to conclude with some final remarks. Uh, first, I would, I would wanna recommend some resources. So, you know, uh, now the first thing is that I would like to recommend my lengthy article, a, a, a critique of deism. Now, of course, this presentation is, is a very simplified and top level overview of the essential points mentioned in the article. Um, uh, but, but you know, the article is very valuable because it dives into potential rebuttals and counter rebuttals to, to the arguments that I presented to you. So if you're going to be having a discussion on this subject with an informed person or, 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 or audience, and it's advisable that you give it a read and fully digest the material so that you're, that you're uh, better prepared. Uh, the second resource is, uh, uh, is religion becoming outdated. So this is an article that I just recently published just a few days ago. And uh, in that article, um, I critique this notion of secular spirituality, uh, this idea that we could attain spirituality without, re without religion. So this new age, do-it-yourself spirituality um, it's something that I focus on critiquing in the article, and I lay out several reasons why the optimal context for pursuing sp uh, uh, spirituality uh, uh, is religion itself, and that religion and theology is extremely essential for, uh, for pursuing uh, 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 spiritu uh, spirituality. Um, the third resource is uh, a lecture on YouTube of mine that you can find, Deconstructing Religious Pluralism. So in that lecture, I talk about the notion of religious salvific pluralism, and I discuss it uh, first from, a, from an Islamic perspective, uh, scripturally, and then I proceed on to address uh, rational arguments in favor of salvific religious pluralism. And the fourth resource is a lecture that I also gave uh, quite recently, uh, you can find, on, find it on YouTube, The Rationale of Hell uh, in Islam. So basically, uh, it's a very lengthy video. It's also transcribed for those who, who uh, prefer to, uh, to read. Um, uh, basically, in this uh, uh, lecture, I, uh, I address some of the most popular and substantive uh, uh, arguments against the notion of hell. And I, I, divide, uh, I kind of dive into it in, 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 in uh, detail. And, um, and so I think all these four resources will be very useful for you. These are all interlinked and interconnected, as you could imagine, and they all fall under this wider umbrella of opposition towards religion. And uh, I think if you consult these four resources and really digest the material, I think you'll have a very, inshallah, a very robust and strong grounding in this subject, and you'll be able to discuss these issues uh, with, much, with, with much more confidence. Um, another thing that we have to bear in mind is that we need to treat matters on a case-by-case -case basis. So as I said, um, deists hold different opinions regarding certain theological standards. You know, uh, uh, you need to make sure, you need to make sure that you clarify from the deist that you're speaking to um, about what he or she believes before making any assumptions of your own. All right, and and look, you know this this presentation and and uh, you know my articles and my lectures they they tend to take a very uh, intellectual approach to these subjects. They're you know they're they're meant to provide you with the intellectual arsenal, so to speak, required to to deconstruct uh, deism. However, in in Dawa in Dawa, you know, please remember that things are much more complicated than what meets the eye. Uh, a lot of people who are deists might outwardly pretend like they have intellectual doubts, but in reality, their problems might be more emotional. You know, um, uh, for example, I mean, someone might be fed up with Islam or organized religion in general because of very poor experiences with the uh, religious people. 
or, 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 or perhaps because they feel that deism uh, offers them a, a path to live their lives freely without having to abide by any religious rules. Um, it could be for a number of reasons. And, and so you just have to remember that critical point. I mean, if anything, my personal experience has taught me that emotions tend to be the main reason why people struggle uh, with religion. Um, and uh, lastly, and it goes without saying that, that hidayah, guidance, you know, only comes by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, these, these intellectual arguments are, are nothing but a means through which we, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows guidance upon those who, whose difficulties and struggles uh, truly and, and sincerely are uh, intellectual in nature. And um, yeah, and you know, with that, I conclude my presentation. Barakallahu uh, feekum uh, for listening. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions at this point. Jazakallahu uh, khairan. Jazakallahu khairan, Ustaz, for enlightening us. Now we are going to begin the question and ask session. This will be very brief. The questions will be taken through the chat box. Uh, the chat box is open now. You can send your questions to me or our co-host Nahyan Choudhury. We will read the questions aloud and Ustaz will answer them inshallah. So if you have any questions, you can send them to me or our co-host Nahyan Choudhury. Then we will read the questions and Ustaz will answer them inshallah. But please, uh, it's a request. Of, uh, don't ask questions that are not related to today's topic. Please stay on the topic. So we have got the first question right now. Uh, am I able to see these questions or? Uh, Ustaz, if they are they come are they coming to you uh, privately? If if they send the questions to you, you will be able to see them. But if they send the questions to uh, any other co-host, you won't be able to see them. But we will read the questions to you. Okay. Okay. So the first question is, uh, what about beasts who think God is just a blind force with no wisdom or moral property? What about deists who believe that God is simply a blind force? With, is that the quote? With no wisdom or moral property. Um, uh, if, if uh, you know, uh, 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 a, a God that is simply a blind force without wisdom would be a God that has no uh, consciousness, that has no mind, that has no will. And in order to, be, to, to create the universe, the, 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 the being that created the universe must know where everything fits. So it must have knowledge in order to know where everything fits and to know how to uh, create this universe. Uh, and it must also have uh, power. And with that knowledge and that will, uh, it, uh, it would be able to, uh, that being would be able to effectively direct that power in order to actualize uh, the intended objectives, uh, such as creation of the universe. So. A, an entity that is merely a blind force or uh, that lacks willpower would not be one that would be able to create the universe such as ours. And it would not even be a moral agent. So the arguments that we laid out in terms of the, object, uh, the objectivity of moral values would also, would also apply here. Moving on to the next question. What would you recommend as a starter to show Islam is true to the deists? Mm, that's, a, uh, that, that's a lengthy topic. And um, I guess uh, we were focusing more on um, critiquing deism here rather than trying to proffer uh, evidences for Islam. Uh, I don't think that there is any specific method of trying to prove Islam to a deist uh, compared to trying to prove that Islam is true to any other non-Muslim. Um, I think when it comes to evidences for Islam, you'll find that Muslims 
uh, uh, would differ on their approach uh, in this subject. Um, uh, I, I have my own uh, kind of method that, that I follow uh, and other Muslim apologists follow their own different methods as well uh, in terms of which arguments that they would like to uh, highlight and, and prioritize in terms of strength and, and capacity to, to convince uh, uh, non-Muslims to, to believe that Islam is true. Um, uh, I think that is worthy of a separate lecture uh, on its own. But uh, if the question is, is there a specific way to recommend that, uh, to demonstrate that Islam is true to deists in particular? I do not uh, necessarily think uh, that there's a specific method that I would follow. Okay, the next question is, can a deist be agnostic about the epistemic weight of revelation? Can a deist be an agnostic about the epistemic weight of revelation? Um, I'll, I guess I'm trying to understand uh, what the question is. If, if the question is, uh, if the question is trying to say, can a deist be neutral in terms of believing whether God uh, would send a revelation uh, to us or not? Um, I think it's uh, may, perhaps it's theoretically possible. Uh, I guess someone uh, could say, um, I do not believe. I do not believe that God has sent down revelation, uh, but I'm open to the idea that he possibly may send us revelation. Uh, that, 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 that could be theoretically possible, but, uh, but I don't know if we're even talking about deism anymore because deists typically take a very proactive and affirmative stance when they say that God does not intervene in the world, I mean that—that that is what deism uh, is. Uh, that that uh, that that they would assert that God does not intervene in the world, and that's how they know. Um, that's how they know why none of the religions, organized religions, divine religions, uh, are true, and they actually advance arguments uh, in favor of that. Um, so that's typically the stance that they hold. That that natural revelation, quote unquote natural revelation, uh, meaning uh, we come to know uh, of, of theological and moral truth through, through the strict use of our reason, is the, is the epistemic method that we follow, that is meant to be followed. And, um, and that, is, uh, uh, that, that is one of the, uh, uh, that, that is a core element of their beliefs. When it comes to the whole idea can they believe that God may send revelation in the future? Um, I do tackle that uh, in the article. You know, I actually say, what if they say, uh, well, maybe God hasn't sent nothing so far, but said something, he may send something in the future. I actually will tackle that in the article, and that's something that you could, you know, refer back to as well. I hope I interpreted the question uh, correctly. Uh, I hope I, I have oh, that's how I, I interpreted it. The question is, yeah. what if a deist disputes the statement that non-meaningful acts are unwise? Uh, can you say that again? What if he disputes? The statement that non-meaningful acts are unwise. Um, well, I, I would simply appeal to our intuitions that, you know, for something to be wise uh, uh, would, would entail that whatever it is we're talking about has, has an underlying meaning and purpose to it. Um, you know, uh, uh, if we say, hey, hey, Ahmed, that was a wise decision that you made. You know, are we talking about something meaningless or something meaningful here? That you the, the reason why you made a wise decision, Ahmed, was because um, I don't know, there's no meaning to it. Or do you, when you said, oh, hey, Ahmed, you made a wise decision, you meant to say, yeah, the decision that you did actually ended up actualizing the objectives and goals 
uh, that you set out to, uh, uh, to, to, to attend or are actually even beyond your expectations. Uh, the point is, is that we deem things to be wise uh, for a reason. And it usually entails the actualization and the realization of uh, certain goals and objectives. But to say that something non-meaningful could be wise, um, uh, I, I just think it's so self-evident that, that this is false. Uh, I, I would, I would uh, ask some, I would ask everyone to just ask themselves, whenever you use the word wise to describe something, what do you actually mean by that? Are, are you actually referring to something meaningless? Surely not. Surely not. So uh, what then of um, uh, uh, speaking about the, uh, an exceedingly or, a, or an infinitely uh, the, uh, you know, wise designer of this universe? And so, uh, again, I'm just trying to play, I'm just trying to play the game that the deist likes to play, right? You, 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 you want to make yourself out to be all rational, and you want to use rationality to, to, to advance your, your, your worldview. Okay, let's play the rationality game. And I just don't think that your arguments uh, are, and your stances are tenable. And that's all I'm basically trying to say to the deist here. Uh, moving on to our next question. How do we refute the idea that God created us like a machine in which we can, we are operating like the machines, like the artific artificial intelligence. We can operate ourselves automatically. Uh, uh, sorry, is the question saying, how do we know we're not? No, no. The question is saying, how do we refute the idea God created us like a machine in which we can operate ourselves automatically, like artificial intelligence. How do we refute the idea that God created us like machines in which we could take care of ourselves? I mean, uh, I don't, uh, I think the, 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 the deistic uh, position is, is, uh, is saying something more than that. It's not just saying, Oh, God! Um, God uh, created us and just let us be. Uh, it's saying that God created us and neglected us, neglected our universe, because that's the that's the key argument that forms the basis of why they are uh, strongly against the notion of divine intervention and miracles. It, it is upon that basis. Uh, once they say, "Oh, maybe, maybe God." Could intervene, then then they cannot assert their their stance confidently. So they're not just simply saying, they're not just simply saying God created us and just let us uh, operate uh, on our own and uh, for us to figure things out by ourselves. Uh, even though even though that is still a problematic uh, uh, idea, uh, you know, especially when it comes to figuring 